online. Well, let me open the hearing by welcoming a new member, Jim Jordan from Ohio, recently elected. We're glad to have you. I'd also like to welcome our witnesses. I beg your pardon, Mr. Ryan. Of <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it, Chairman. I, too, just wanted to welcome our colleague, uh, Jim, to the committee. Uh, just a couple things on Jim. Uh, he's a champion wrestler. You can just kind of tell by looking at his ears. Uh, <laughs> and he, he graduated from the University of Wisconsin with a degree in economics. He graduated from Ohio State with a master's in education, Capital University with a law degree. He served both in the Ohio General Assembly and the Ohio State Senate. He's a great addition to our committee, and uh, we're all looking forward to working with you, Jim. Welcome to the committee. I'd also like to welcome our witnesses, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Gordon England, who's been here before, and we appreciate his coming again. The Under Secretary of Defense, the Comptroller, Tina Jonas, who is a, an alumnus of the Hill, and we're glad to have you. And the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Cartwright, you honor us with your presence. We appreciate your coming also. They're here, of course, to discuss the 2009 defense budget. On behalf of the committee, we appreciate your coming, but above all, we appreciate your service to our country. Our purpose is to gain a better understanding of the President's 2009 defense budget, what it includes, what it excludes, and what it portends, especially for the long-run future. There are two particularly noteworthy features of the defense budget that we'd like to explore with you this morning. First, the absence of a full-year estimate for the war. There's only a $70 billion so-called placeholder for the war operations in 2009, and nothing, nothing at all, no additional amount beyond 2009. Second, the so-called base defense budget appears to us to decline in real terms beyond the budget year, 2009. This seems to us at odds with the administration's defense plans if we understand them. We need to understand better your real, most likely budget if we're going to make the trade-offs and balance the priorities and put this budget on a sustainable fiscal course. We'll all claim that our target is to balance the budget by 2012, but that balance will be a bogus objective. If we don't have good input, we won't have good output. Without that understanding, whether it be for the war, for base day-to-day -day defense, the so-called base budget, We'll be taking steps in the dark as we try to plot a path to a balanced budget, and it'll be much more difficult than it needs to be. In fact, gaming the process helped put us in this hole. There are lots of reasons we're deep in deficit now. No question that the recession took its toll and could take its toll again. There's no question that war has been costly or that the 9-11 episode was costly. All of these things have contributed. But you may recall that Secretary Rumsfeld deferred the submission of his first real defense budget, saying he needed first to consider it in terms of what he wanted to do by way of transformation. But when F Secretary Rumsfeld finally submitted his real budget, I think that was in June, he acknowledged before the House Armed Services Committee that one reason he had delayed or deferred was that the President had asked that the tax cut bill come first. President Bush, in effect, told us that we could have guns and butter and tax cuts, too, and never mind the deficits. But in three years, by 2013, the budget bottom line was no longer a surplus of $236 billion, as it had been in 2000, but a deficit of $413 billion. And it appears to us that this same attitude underlies much of the budget submitted this year. It's with this, against this backdrop that we review the defense budget. We have huge deficits, an economy that is or could be headed towards recession, and a bow wave of baby boomers, all of which will put enormous pressure on the budget's bottom, bottom line. There are monumental challenges in front of us, and the first order of business today is to get a complete understanding of our defense plan, which after all constitutes the lion's share, far more than half of all discretionary spending. Since the year 2000, the defense budget has ridden the crest of a long wave, experienced its largest longest sustained buildup since World War II. Spending or outlays on national defense totaled $675 billion for 2009, and measured in 2008 constant dollars rank as the highest defense budget since World War II, surpassing the peaks of Vietnam and Korea. Spending reaches this high level, even though the budget includes only $70 billion in new budget authority to finance just a portion of the total cost that we're likely to incur 
in maintaining substantial forces in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2009. Looking beyond the budget year, projections reflect a $61 billion nominal cut in defense for 2010 and cuts below the level needed to keep pace with inflation thereafter. There is no funding after 2009, no funding for Iraq and Afghanistan, and the base budget appears to us to be cut in real terms, and that just seems to us to be at odds with reality. Costs have increased every year for operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we believe that costs will probably continue at some level over the five-year budget window which we work with. For the base budget, current defense plans call for increases above inflation, not decreases. CBO, in an update to its report on the long-term implications of current defense plans, which was issued in December, concluded that current defense plans, excluding the war, could cost billions more per year than the administration's budget shows. Let me just show you some slides to sort of wrap up my point and to give context to what we'd like to talk about this morning. Jose, if we could just take them one by one, please, sir. That's number four, I believe. This shows that even without full war funding, with only the $70 billion provided for 2009, the level of expenditure in real dollars, 2008 dollars, is higher than Vietnam, higher than Korea, higher than any time since World War II. It's a substantial sum of money. Second slide. This shows the basic budget in layer cake fashion, which uh, we put together along with CBO. The bottom sliver is the baseline budget when the Bush administration came to the office. The next layer is the Bush 09 policy additions. And the next layer, several layers, are the future war costs, which I'll come back to. But you can see from 2000 until 2010 or 11, the defense budget has, has more than doubled. Next chart. And this shows you what the war costs have been from 2001 through 2008. This would include the operations we had over Iraq during the period before the, uh, between the Persian Gulf War and the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Come to a very substantial sum, over $800 billion. And of course, the $70 billion bar there at the very far right, one of the bookends, is in contrast to the $196 billion that was uh, required last year. Next chart. We asked CBO, we've asked DOD, but you've declined to give it to us because of the variables involved in projecting this number. We said to them, let's make an assumption that we draw down the force levels that are there today gradually so that by 2013 in both theaters, Iraq and Afghanistan, there's 75,000 troops given the fact that nearly half that number are in Afghanistan today and are likely to be there for some time, that's probably a pretty conservative assumption. But we assume that by 2013, the troop level would hit 75,000 in both theaters together and then would stay at a steady state for the rest of the projection period. When you added up the total amount of the continued deployment in both of those places over the next 10 years, the total comes to a trillion dollars on top of the $800 billion RA expense. is a substantial sum of money. Next chart. In addition, as we looked at last year's budget and then again at this year's budget, we found that there was a trend here, namely that in the out years beyond the current budget year, there was a downward decline in the budget for the base defense operations, day-to-day -day defense operations, it is not huge, but it seems to be at odds with what we understand to be the likely course of the defense budget. And when I asked uh, Secretary Gates about this at the House Armed Services Committee, he indicated that this was the product of a negotiation with uh, OMB. And it did result, if they complied with OMB's growth, uh, defense growth objectives, it would, it would amount to a decline in real spending on national defense. So one of the questions we have for you this morning is, is that a realistic forecast of likely defense spending in the foreseeable future? Next chart. This shows you that the direct budgetary cost of the Iraq war alone exceeds $600 billion. That includes a request for 2008 and assumes it'll be appropriated. It comes to $608 billion. 
a substantial sum of money in sunk costs. Next chart. We frequently hear today talk that the defense budget, Mr. Mr. Bush came to the Citadel and made a speech during his campaign and then went back again and made another defense speech. But he indicated then that we needed to get defense spending up over and above 3 percent of GDP. Three and a half to 4 percent was what he pr proposed. Well, it appears to us if you look at national security broadly considered, not just 050 for national for the Pentagon, but of course the nuclear program at DOE, all of 050. If you look at international affairs, or much of it which goes to national security, and if you look at veterans programs, which after all are collateral costs of collateral cost of uh, maintaining a substantial military over the years, you get a total of expenditures of between uh, around $800 billion. And as a percent of GDP, that's 5.3 percent of GDP already. There's a lot of talk about having a resolution that would uh, dictate that spending be at least 4 percent of GDP. As we see national security, and you continually define it that way yourselves, homeland security, national defense, veterans affairs, uh, is, is well above 4 percent already. It's 5.3 percent. Next chart. And this kind of rubs it in. It's not really fair. You might right, call this the value of having allies. It's just one reminder of what the uh, first Persian Gulf War, War cost us because we had contributing allies. We had the, the Japanese contributing. We had the Germans contributing. If it didn't contribute uh, troops, they contributed real money. And of course, the Persian Gulf states put up substantial sums themselves. And the net cost to our budget was $2.1 billion. We're not suggesting you could pull that off again in today's episode in Iraq, but it does raise the question, to what extent are we trying to build new alliances and, and a new division of labor in the world so that our allies in different regions of the world share a bigger burden of the total cost of defense? Next chart. Well, this just gives you another grounds for wondering if the out-year numbers are good, and that is the so-called SAR reports, which are summarized periodically by GAO, show that all of our major weapon systems are experiencing substantial cost growth, particularly those that uh, like the uh, F-35. The F-22, of course, has been a very expensive airplane to buy. The Navy is now buying a, a number of ships like the uh, late next carrier, which have a very high front-end cost on the theory that the operational costs and the life cycle costs will be substantially less. Let's hope it works out that way. but. We've seen substantial overruns in the acquisition of military. On your watch, on everybody's watch, it's the nature of the beast. I'm not laying it at your lap. It just happened, and nobody seems to have been able to, to uh, contain the cost of major weapon systems. That just gives you the overview of why we're concerned this morning. We didn't come here to berate you. We appreciate your service to the country. But we need good numbers. We need a good, firm basis for projecting what likely costs for defense are going to be so we can face squarely the hard decisions we've got to make if we are indeed genuine about trying to get this budget on a sustainable course back in balance by 2012. Thank you for coming. But before your testimony, I would like to recognize Mr. Ryan for a statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman Spratt. Welcome back, Secretary, Deputy Secretary England, and welcome General Cartwright and Mrs. Jonas to the committee. I appreciate the work you do and the monumental task that you have managing an organization with over 3 million employees, facilities in over 5,000 locations in 163 countries and a budget of over a half a trillion dollars. I also appreciate the work you do in managing an agency that is attempting to transform from a Cold War footing to a more agile joint force while prosecuting a very challenging global war against terrorism. And I'm particularly grateful to the men and women who put on a uniform each and every day and answer the call to protect our freedom while placing their lives in the line in places far away from their families and loved ones. I believe that providing for our national security is the highest obligation of the federal government. And if you could call it slide one, please. The dramatic defense cuts of the 1990s left the Department of Defense ill-equipped to meet the new challenges we've faced over the last decade. I would hope, however, that with the funding levels provided since 2000, an increase of over 80 percent to the base budget, the Department is getting on a more sound financial ground as we prepare to enter the next decade and the new challenges it will bring. The war on terror has been very costly, both in the sacrifice made by our fighting forces and in dollars.
but not as costly as enduring the alternative, in action in the face of adversity. As a member of this committee, I have been and will continue to be supportive of providing the Department the full funding it needs to, pr to pr continue to prosecute this war. I am disappointed, however, that the majority has failed to act on the President's request of over one year ago for supplemental funding. I am also disappointed, though not surprised given the circumstances, that the Administration only requested a portion of funds for the war in 2009. This committee has called for transparency in regard to war funding, both in the Administration's request and in the budget. Clearly, there is still room for improvement on this front. So it is my hope that we will use our time today to gain a better understanding of what the Department's 09 supplemental requests will be. And if you could pull up uh, number 7, please. <clears throat> this just gives you in perspective of where we are. And this is a real apples to apples comparison of national defense spending as a percentage of GDP. We contributed more as a percentage of our economy under the Carter administration than we are today. And we are facing a war that is global in reach a war that is going to cost us uh, a lot in a lot of time. And so I think it is important to put these things in perspective. I think it is important to, to consider the fact that this is our highest priority for our nation, for our Federal Government. But at the same time, given all the dollars involved and all the sacrifices that we see from our men and women that we represent, we need to have more transparency in the way we spend our, our constituents' dollars. And with that, I, I welcome uh, our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. I ask unanimous consent that uh, all members who did not have a chance to make an opening statement be able to submit one for the record at this point. And Secretary England, General Cartwright, Secretary Jones, you can submit your full statement for the record. We will make it part of the record so that you can summarize it as you see fit. We again thank you for coming and the floor is yours. We look forward to your presentation. Good, so Chairman Spratt and uh, Mr. Ryan, members of the House uh, Committee on the Budget, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. We do appreciate the opportunity to come and discuss the budget and the work costs with you. Uh, I will tell you, for me, I always, first of all, I learn something that's always informative for me, and I hope it's a benefit to this committee, so I thank you for the opportunity to be here. We will give you a package of our charts to take back to the Pentagon with you. <laughs> uh, it is a delight to have uh, General Jim Cartwright with us, you know, because this is the first time with me before the Budget Committee to have the General with me, so I, I welcome him, and also to have Ms. Tina Jonas back with us again today. Uh, I will try to respond to a few of your comments. Uh, there will only be one opening statement, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's, that will be my opening statement, and then because I know time is short, we'll get immediately then to questions and dialogue. Uh, I do want to comment that the President's base budget, as you know, is $515.4 billion. Uh, but you need to know, I mean, that is a lot of money. On the other hand, we do respond to the threat in today's environment. So, I mean, this is, uh, in our very best estimate, what it takes to defend this nation, defend our freedom and liberties. And we are in a very complex security environment. It's distinguished by a number of very prominent factors. First of all, of course, terrorism and the the war that we are in and our magnificent people are fighting every day. Uh, we still obviously concerned about the whole proliferation of WMD, failed and failing states and emerging powers who in, whose intentions are unclear. So we're not only fighting the war, but we're also obviously trying to defer conflicts in the future and that requires military capability to defer future conflicts. Now each of those threats pays or, pose their own unique challenges and each demands a certain set of capabilities, but our total security relies on a comprehensive approach and that's distinguished by a balanced set of capabilities for the entire spectrum of challenges and that's what we try to do is balance across this entire capability. Now when appropriate, the funds that we've asked for will provide the resources necessary to execute the national military strategy. Now 515 Four billion is a lot of money, but I, it does have to be considered. I've heard two sets of numbers today in terms of uh, historical context. I mean, we look at in terms obviously of our Department of Defense spending, it has grown since 9-11 and we are now at about 4 percent of GDP. I think that's the charts that Mr. Ryan showed. Now that is, however, as a charge showed the lowest invested by this nation in time of war, I think in modern history at least, because while imperfect, for point of reference, it was about 9 percent during Vietnam, 11.7 percent during the Korean War. So fortunately, while 
while our costs have gone up to defend the nation, so has the basic economics of the nation have grown considerably during that period of time. So we are to some extent a beneficiary of a vibrant economy, but we are also less of a cost for the economy than we have been in past conflicts. Now, your, the question you raised about what is the cost, in particular the cost of war relative to the $70 billion, I, I think Secretary Gates was uh, clear on his testimony to both the SASC and the HASC. Uh, in addition to the 515, which the Secretary stated at that time, in addition to the 515.4 base budget, as you know, our request includes $70 billion in an emergency bridge funding to take us, to bridge us until we know what the right number is. Now, the total requirement, as you comment, it will indeed be larger. And later this year, once we have an accurate appreciation of the requirement, we will have a more detailed request submitted to you. Now, when Secretary Gates was pressed on this matter, he offered a number of $170 billion as a total requirement, but he also said it was definitely imperfect and imperfect for a number of reasons, which is why we did not turn this number in earlier, but instead turned in a bridge. First, as mentioned, we do not yet have the appropriation for uh, FY 2008 in terms of our supplemental. So we have, of that request, we still have $102 billion outstanding. Frankly, we do not know when we're going to get it or if we will get that amount. And that will cause increased cost and disruption. But of course, depend if we don't get it, then of course that will change completely as we go forward in the 09 estimate. And then in addition, what adjustments will be made from the upcoming recommendations of General Petraeus, which will be in about a month, General Petraeus will come in and brief the Congress. So that could indeed result in some significant change going forward. But in addition, as you know, there's definitely going to be a change in administration. And uh, that fact, the fact is of this supplemental, three quarters of it will be spent during the next administration. So in the next administration, we'll obviously have some say about how they view this and what the expenditure should be. So I would, in, in, as we go forward, I, I, I would like to say what's most important to us, and I think what's most important to the nation and to our men and women who are on the front lines is I would urge the Congress to support first the budget request, but also to expeditiously appropriate the outstanding balance of the year's war funding request so that we can fund our troops and provide them the support, the support that they deserve, and importantly, to, dis to reduce any disruption of effort associated with this impending change in administration. I mean, last year when we had continuing rev resolutions, we did not have our war funding. That was hugely disruptive. And now we're about to go through a period of planned disruption. That is a change of administration. People leave. Policies change. And if we have an uncertain uh, budget at that time, I can tell you it would be extraordinarily people for the people who replace me and other people in the next administration to carry on in any efficient and effective manner. So. I would urge the Congress, particularly this year, to act uh, expeditiously. I do want to comment that while we are all debating the budget, there are men and women who are on the front line standing to watch, securing our freedom and liberty, which is what the Department of Defense is all about. And so while these are important discussions, we should not lose sight of the fact that we do have people deployed every day and we do need to support them. And I believe the American people do want to give them our full support. So. Look, we are prepared to uh, have a dialogue, answer questions, hopefully uh, help this process along today. And so uh, Chairman Spratt, Representative Ryan, and members of the committee, uh, we look forward to the dialogue. And we thank you for the opportunity to be here for that opportunity. I have a statement you would like to make? I do not. Okay. Secretary Jonas? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The overarching question is, is the President's budget submission a realistic budget? And I think the answer is it's not by at least $100 billion because that amount, which the Secretary has authorized off the seat of his pants before the Senate Armed Services Committee, has to be added to the $70 billion that is in place as a placeholder. 
Is the revised number now a rough approximation of $170 billion? Well, it's a, it's a number. I mean, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I mean, here's, a, here's a dilemma we have. On one hand, we are required to give you numbers that we can support, and so we provide your rationale for the numbers when we give them to you. And in this case, I mean, we, we don't have a basis because we don't know what decisions will be made next month after General Petraeus comes on board, and we also don't know the status of the money that we're spending today. So we're already spending money out of our base budget that's frankly going to the war costs, so we are already pretty much in a dilemma. I mean, trying to, to justify the number with the uncertainties we have today puts us in a dilemma. So, I mean, frankly, the decision on the 70 billion is an OMB decision, but I will tell you that uh, I felt that that was the right approach, and I actually had a lot of discussions on that subject in terms of what was most realistic that we could do to provide some reasonable confidence in the numbers. So we know it's at least a $70 billion, and we have in the past, I think three or four times now, we've had a $70 billion bridge, and that's how we have managed to, to go each year. Then last year, of course, we came in with a full budget, that actually turned out to be the worst of all for us because we didn't get a budget approved. We ended up with a CR and we still haven't gotten the war costs. So I, mean, I understand there's frustration on behalf of this uh, committee, but, but there's also some frustration on our side in trying to find a way to work through all this that meets all the criteria that everybody would like us to meet. And we are trying to do that, sir. I mean, I, I can assure you we are trying to be as, as open and forthright as we can in this matter, and we'll can you continue to be that way with you. Well, let's, let's take Afghanistan. You, what, we've been there, what, now, six years? And we've just increased our presence there. And General Jones has just come back saying that uh, he's, he's disappointed with the progress we've made there. We've got a South Carolina contingent that uh, Gresham Barrett and I are proud of, the 218th uh, Brigade. And they're doing their damnedest to uh, help train the Afghan army. We've got a long way to go. Nevertheless, we also have a cost basis that goes back five or six years. Isn't there some way we can, ex and we're likely to be there for some time to come, isn't there some way we could extrapolate for that cost and determine what a good number is for approximating the likely cost of the deployment to Afghanistan? Mr. Spratt, I mean, it'd be. I think it'd be wonderful if we can do it. I mean, the, the problem is war is inherently unpredictable. If it was predictable, obviously this would be much easier on the battlefield and then easier to cost. But we have a foe uh, that is not predictable. Obviously, they are a determined enemy we have. And so it's very difficult to look uh, years ahead in terms of what the outcomes will be. Well, General so, Petraeus I mean, that's, that's apparently is going to come back with, uh, we're going to build down to 140,000 troops sending, uh, trimming the, some of the uh, brigades that were added to uh, facilitate the surge, but the troop level that he's shooting for is 140,000 troops. Well, is that, is, uh, let, let me let the bite. that be used as an approximation of the cost of this deployment? Let me, let me let the vice address that, and then I'll comment. General Petraeus will come in and comment on the plan that was laid out um, over the last year. Um, the troop numbers, somewhere between 130 and 140,000, have been associated with the press. The actual numbers and the work that we're doing is on the classified side, so we can we can have another conversation about that for the details. But the intent was to get down to the pre-surge levels in counting the brigade combat teams of 15 brigade combat teams by the middle of July. He will come in and assess his progress on that activity. We need to understand his assessment in order to make sure that we're going to be able to draw down to those levels, where we will draw down between now and July, and what implications that has beyond July. Those are the types of things that we hope to find out and, and then come back to you with numbers based on that testimony. But we do have those numbers within a fairly reasonable range, don't we? We're talking about somewhere between 125 and 150,000 troops. So, so, Mr. Sprite, if I can, the uh, NDAA requires, I believe, and someone can correct me here, but I believe uh, we're now required to provide monthly to the Congress uh, projections, including three months into the future in terms of troops. And there was, about a week ago, uh, 
people from the Department of Defense came and briefed our uh, committees a record, and that is classified document, uh, but it is available. And, and I, my view is that may give you some better insight, that, but again, that is today's projection, and that's why even the 140 number, as I think General Ham had a number of qualifiers with that, uh, pretty much along the lines of what you just heard uh, from General Cartwright. The chart that we put up, which is taken from CBO and shows the out-year cost beyond this year, assuming a build-down to 75,000 troops in both theaters, does that number ring true to you? Is that approximation something that uh, you, you find a reasonable take on based upon the assumptions? Of course, everything's based on the assumptions, uh, Mr. Spratt. So, I mean, pick whatever the assumptions are, and I'm sure you can get a number and however you multiply that out, but it's all based on what those assumptions are. And of course, I don't know how you, I mean, I don't frankly know how you arrive at those assumptions. I mean, we don't have those assumptions built in. I mean, it, it is a set of assumptions. I would guess for planning, whatever you feel is appropriate to do that, but, but we don't have a set of numbers like that in terms of assumptions that far into the future. I mean, we're still frankly in the, in the debate today in terms of what the FY09 GY cost will be, right? And, and, and we won't get any clarity, more clarity than that for another month or two, at which time we will have more clarity and I think be able to give you a more precise estimate. But going out that period of time and, and estimating the war, I just think is extraordinarily difficult. Let me, let me ask you about the chart five, please, Jose. This is, something was presented in last year's budget and it occurs again somewhat different numbers in this year's budget namely in real terms over five years the future defense budget that you submitted to us is shown as declining negative real growth is is this a realistic portrayal of what the defense budget is likely to be over that five-year period of time so first of all, I guess the validity is depending on what the inflation is over the future, and I guess that's one thing we don't know now. It is, that is the case, by the way, the budget right now, based on our latest projection, uh, OMB projection of inflation, it is below inflation. Uh, I know the Secretary would like, obviously, to have a budget that accounts for inflation with at least some modest growth, but we have not had those discussions with OMB because I mean, we do that the year we're in, the, we're in the year of the budget, and then we work that year and we update it. But for 010, uh, we will leave, uh, we will have a budget for 010, and in 010, we will discuss with OMB, you know, the basis of the budget going forward. But I would, again, the Secretary said what he would like is to have it at least accommodate inflation, hopefully with some modest growth. But... That's a discussion we'll have in the O-10 budget going forward. Well, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, and the Congressional Research Service have both done studies of your plans for the foreseeable future, the so-called FIDUP, and they simply can't conceive of the budget costing less than inflation would require. In fact, they think it additional costs will be substantially above inflation unless you make major changes weapon system procurement or in force levels. So Mr. Spratt, in the past, I can, I can tell you my own experience is uh, now in the last seven years, there was a period where we were below inflation. Uh, we did indeed have it adjusted and OMB agreed to adjust it for inflation. And by the way, that was about the time we also agreed to grow the force. So you're right, the budget actually went up after that point because we decided to grow the Army and the Marine Corps. So we actually had a growth in the budget. But certainly Department of Defense would, would recommend that, that we have a, a, at a minimum a flat budget to accommodate for inflation, but we will not have that discussion with OMB for some time yet. Let me ask you two more questions. One is about weapon systems, and I said it's it's been the it's been the uh, frustration of every administration, Democrat and Republican. But nevertheless, GAO has done an overview of cost growth in major acquisition programs, the so-called selected acquisition programs, the SARS, and found that from 2002 through 2007, there was cost growth of 392 billion dollars large sum of money. What are you doing to contain 
the cost growth of major weapon systems, new weapon systems coming off the uh, production line. So, Mr. Ryan, I believe that we have now incorporated into the system some fundamental changes, and, and the fundamental changes is, uh, if I can discuss just one or two here, one of the fundamental changes, we, we now look at what we call capability portfolios. That is, we used to look at individual programs, of which we have thousands of individual programs, but the fact of the matter is, you can lump these programs into capabilities where a lot of programs come together to have to work together to provide a, a top-level capability. So we have, now, we have now put these programs together and we manage them differently. And, a, and we are also telling people that they can no longer just have cost growth. They have to go back and look at the fundamental requirements and do trade-offs in terms of requirements and costs. So we are working to tighten the system internally. I will tell you, however, when you listen to our contractors, what the contractors require is stability and predictability in terms of programs. And so, I mean, these, when we get delays in budgets or we don't get supplementals, et cetera, I can tell you what it does. It adds instability and unpredictability in our contractor force, and therefore they do not invest for the long term for our program. So we're already at low rates, and disruptions are very costly. So. I think this is an area where we both need to work together, uh, both the Congress, the DOD, and our contractors, but I believe this problem does run deep, and it has to do with both budgeting and the way programs are managed and requirements, and we are working that as hard as we can, sir. One right. final question. And so, can I, can I have the – Yes, sir. Please say one word here, please. Real quick on that. General also, Carter. What we have done over the last year is in the management between defining what the requirement is and – defining the acquisition strategy, we have brought the acquisition community into the requirements discussion. We have set trip wires and expectations on cost that, that get tripped based on the selected acquisition reports. So we have a way of monitoring and setting the expectation up front so the acquisition community ex understands what's tradable and what is absolutely essential to the warfighter. That helps us provide stability in the requirements side so that these requirements don't grow over the life of the program. Do you think that if we have a substantial deployment in Iraq throughout the next 10 years and a substantial deployment in Afghanistan, you're going to be able to complete the recapitalization of the armed forces based upon the systems that are now in acquisition and those that you know will be coming out of the pipeline? And we've got a pretty substantial investment account increase coming in the, right now upon us, and it's, it, it continues for some time to come for R&D and for procurement. Do you think that you can sustain that level of procurement to modernize our forces, transform our forces, and at the same time maintain this level of troops and you know, in s some sort of engagement in th those two theaters? Of course, right now, Mr. Spratt, the war cost is separate from the base budget. So in the base budget, we do include, and, and thanks to the Congress and the support, uh, both the R&D budgets are up, and this year, for the first time, our procurement budgets are over $100 billion. So uh, for the first time, I, we, we have substantially, I believe when I came in, we were down like $40 billion or something back in 2001. We're down about $100 billion in terms of modernization accounts. So those accounts, uh, what we have factored into the FIDIP in terms of our modernization are, is accommodated within those base budgets. The war costs, though, are independent, and that's a, for us a separate appropriation. But I would tell you the base budget, uh, we, we do balance and, and make sure that we do have affordable programs in that budget. Good. We've got a vote coming in a few minutes, but we have time for Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first off, uh, S Secretary England, I've got a list of questions I wanted to ask you in writing, uh, if you could respond before yes, sir. instead of taking up all this time on your uh, DOD's budget and health care costs. So I'll, I'll submit this to you, and if you could get this back to me in writing, I'd appreciate that. Yes, sir. Um, one of my concerns is that as we do these supplementals, which we believe the notion of a supplemental is to reimburse the incremental <coughs> costs of war, that things that ought to be long in the base budget get pushed into the supplemental budget. And that is just a concern of ours, just for basic good budgeting principles. And if you look at your supplementals since 2001, You'll notice that the investment account funding has grown from a billion to over 70 billion in 2008 if, if this current request is actually enacted. 
And combined with the irregular 2008 appropriation, investment account spending is $250 billion. For reference, in 2001, it was $104 billion. Uh, why has the spending increased by 140 percent over the last seven years in the procurement, research, development, test, and evaluation accounts? That's question number one. Question number two is, obviously, if, if, if we have equipment that is damaged or worn out in the theater, we replace that, and it's, and it's logical to assume that that is done in the supplemental request. But help me disaggregate what is equipment that is lost in war and what is equipment and procurement that belongs in the base budget. And it seems to me that base budget stuff is creeping into these supplementals. Can you just please elaborate more on that? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ryan, it may be we, we try not to let it migrate, frankly. So we do review every one of these requests. So in the base budget, we do have an attrition number for equipment for normal uh, training operations that we would normally do in our base budget. So there is an attrition number for some replacement equipment in the base budget. And so if an airplane uh, goes down on just, you know, a training unrelated mission, that goes, that's replaced in the base budget. But if it, it is all war related in the global war, then that goes in the supplemental. So we do try to parse that. I, I can't tell you it's, we're well, perfect at this, but we do work at it to make sure that we can support it when we turn it in to you, sir. And I understand we have a 140 percent increase in the investment account uh, in the base budget, but, but we've gone from a billion in the first supplemental to 70 billion in this supplemental. I, am I to take from that 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 is all attributable to war? and war costs and in-theater problems. I mean, this is, you know, this is research, development, test, evaluation, procurement. Um, that's, that's my concern is we're, we're seeing a lot of migration, a billion to 70 billion over just, you know, 01 to this last supplemental. So I'll ask Tina to comment, but for example, the MRAP vehicles alone, 15,000 vehicles is 20 some billion dollars. So that one procurement which is a war cost because it's four uh, men and women deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that alone is 20 some billion dollars for that one vehicle. So that's, that's why if you could just walk me through the numbers, that's would be helpful. OK, Tina, can you help there? Uh, that was, a, I think, a great example because, of course, the MRAP vehicle, if you think about our annual shipbuilding budget, it's about 14 billion dollars. So for that one procurement alone, and that's in force protection. Right. And I would say one area of procurement growth has definitely been in the, the force protection area. Uh, we also are using our vehicles at, at rates that we never envisioned. So they are just wearing out. And it's in some cases, it's five, six, seven times what was expected. In other cases, uh, it's combat losses. We, we've, we've lost uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, in fact, uh, we was just told the other day that we've recently we've lost at least four uh, UAV. So it's the rate and usage that is driving a lot of the procurement associated uh, with it, the G1. I think budget. it'd be helpful to us uh, because obviously we realize we need to invest. I just want to make sure we're investing in the right budget, you know, aisle in yes. the column. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could possibly break that seventy billion down in the investment account that's in the supplemental for us and explain. Um, you know, how this belongs in the supplemental column and not in the base budget, that would be very helpful. Well, of course, the $70 billion that we have as a bridge right now does right. not have any detail associated with it. This no, wait is a, this no, this no, this is a different $70 that's billion. That's different. I'm yeah. sorry. Not, not the, seven, the 70 in the, in the investment account. I believe, uh, see, I'm not familiar with the 70. I've never sort you're of right. parsed it out that way. But I believe, Mr. Ryan, you're asking in the 189 That's billion right. total. That's what I'm asking. Tina, I think the question is in the 189 okay. total, yeah, there's 70 right. billion investment That's account. Right. Yeah, Can we, we break that out? Yeah, we yeah. certainly have that. As a matter of fact, that would be available on our website uh, from from last year. We have the global war on terror that is and all an explanation out. how it belongs in the in, in the incremental war funding and not in the base budget. It, it, certainly, and I'd be happy to come by and, and walk you through. Yeah, that, that, so. I, I'm just interested in that. Yeah, we're worried about this migration. Um, yeah. I know we have a couple minutes left. Uh, uh, perhaps it's this one's for you, uh, Secretary, or maybe for you, General. Um, it's my understanding that the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs recently endorsed the idea of putting um, a budget floor tied to GDP, a 4 percent of GDP for DOD. Um, uh, what is your uh, position and opinion of that proposal? I, whoever wants to comment, I'd appreciate it. Uh, 
if I can comment, Mr. Reiner, there's been discussions. I know the Secretary has discussed this a number of times, and so I would, and, and it's come up a number of times with the Chairman, the Secretary, and myself. I, I would tell you this is still a source of discussion in the Department of Defense. I, uh, I'm not sure we've settled that that's the right approach or not, although there has been discussion in that regard. So, I mean, I'd like to defer that because I, I don't believe we're in a position to say, yes, that's what we believe the right way forward is. But the department's but, actually actively considering whether or not to support this, this proposal? Well, uh, we are definitely having discussions, and whether we will go forward to OMB or not, I think is still an open point at this time. But, uh, but there is a discussion about particularly the 010 budget. What should we be doing going forward in the 010 budget? What is a rational way to do this in terms of having built-in modernization for our military, and particularly for the volunteer force, which is – an expensive force, but uh, when I commented before, predictability is very important in stability. If we had a predictable right floor or just number that we could go forward with, it would help immensely in terms of managing our programs. So that's something we're discussing still, and, and we'd like to get back with you on that subject. Okay. General Cartwright, any? Uh, uh, same lines. Uh, it, it may not be the whole budget. It may be a portion of the budget that we can put some predictability, particularly in our acquisition programs, to allow us to move forward. There is also the attribute of just what is appropriate based on what the need is at the right. time, and should that be pegged to a hard number. Yeah. And, and so we're trying to straddle the fence here between two needs, and we're, and we're not yet at a point where we're ready to articulate exactly how that comes Yeah, I, I just as a budgeteer, I, I think that this idea needs to be looked at a little more closely than, than some might have done. Uh, I think I think that's right. We need predictability. We need to be able to plan out. It, it saves us money in the long run with with contracting and all of those things. But to put some arbitrary number for just this part of our federal budget, to me, just seems like bad budgeting. Uh, well, but but I just you know so we've got to find a better way of getting that predictability, of getting the the commitment and the investment made. And this is just my personal opinion. Then pegging um, some percentage of GDP. Uh, which is setting aside this portion of our budget, which is a, a significant portion, to be treated different than any other portion of our budget. And that, that's something is I would just encourage you as you deliberate on this to really think that one through. Um, yes, I know sir. we've got to get going here, so I, I, I appreciate you not have four and a half minutes to make a vote if you can bear with us. We'll be back as quickly as possible. That'd be and fine. We appreciate your forbearance. Absolutely. Right. The sure. committee will stand in recess subject to the call of the chair.